Okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Jim Pingle, Pingle, and welcome to our PFSense Gold Hangout for June 2015. This month, we're going to be covering high availability uh, using CARP, XML, RPC, and PFSync. Uh, before we get started, got a couple of project notes. Um, PFSense 2.2.3 is out. Uh, just came out uh, yesterday, early yesterday morning. Uh, we've got lots of beneficial improvements and security enhancements. Uh, put a fix in for some file system corruption people were seeing. You know, if the power got yanked or if it crashed, especially uh, right after boot, uh, we've, we've fixed that up. Uh, you can find the release notes up on the blog. Uh, we are tracking uh, an issue that some people are having with IPsec, and we think we got a fix for that. Uh, but we'll, we'll probably be pushing out another update here pretty quickly. Um, our, uh, just so you know, uh, the, the Hangouts like this, uh, also online access to the book and auto config backup for 10 hosts uh, are now available for one year at no cost for those uh, registering an SG series hardware device or a C2758 from our store. Um, so like if, you, if you've got like a 4860 or an 8860, one, you know, something like that that you bought from us, uh, you, you should uh, now be able to access some of those other resources. Although if you're watching this, presumably you already know that or you've already got gold. Uh, we're going to put up a blog post about that here pretty soon. Uh, we are actively in a push to get the book updated. Uh, we have changed it over to a different format. It, previously, it was in DocBook. Now we're building it in Sphinx. Uh, we're generating a new online HTML format, so it'll be you know, pretty easy to browse through. Uh, but we are still going to have downloads for you know, PDF, EPUB, and Mobi, um, and they won't track too far behind the, the online HTML, HTML uh, version, but that'll, that'll, that'll see the updates quicker. Um, and you know some some tiers of access will only uh, see the uh, the HTML version. They won't necessarily you know, be able to grab the PDFs and such. But if you've got gold, you can get it all. So uh, we do have a, a brand new uh, 8861U that's now shipping. Uh, it's similar to the 8860 that we were, had been selling, but it's in a 1U chassis. Uh, actually has an internal ATX power supply. The board's got an ATX power supply connector and. Uh, the the one U chassis actually has a spot for you know two actual two uh, two and a half inch drives so uh, pretty good uh, pretty good setup you could do there with uh, like G mirror RAID things like that uh, so it's pretty much the same as the C2758 uh, except uh, the expandability options are a bit different the 2758 you can drop in you know like a a, a 10 gig two 10 gig ports or a two or four expansion of one gig ports. Uh, the, the 8860 is locked at the six Intel one gig ports. So it does have mini PCI uh, and inside, but you know, in terms of actually what you can, what you can do in terms of network expandability uh, in a rack mount, not as important. Uh, like you can't really, you, you could do wireless, but usually with a rack mount uh, setup, you wouldn't want wireless gear in your rack. Um, though in theory, you know, you could, especially if you've just got, you know, you happen to have a short rack somewhere, you know, centrally located that's not actually in a noisy cage. Um, we also have our 2220, the, the smaller one, the, the two NIC device coming pretty soon. Uh, hope, I think um, at the very latest by the end of next month, but should be should be pretty quick here. I think we're just waiting on the boards now. Um, and that's going to be closer to the Alex and APU price point. Uh, and those are those are pretty nice devices. They're really speedy. Uh, good for your good bang for your buck there. Uh, and it's not not here yet, uh, but we are also going to have a 4861U variant. Uh, so sort of like the, the, the existing 4860, but in a 1U chassis like the 8860. That's going to be a, a real good uh, price performance compromise there. Okay, um, about this Hangout, uh, we've got a lot to cover, so I might move pretty fast. Um, we can all, there will be plenty of time for questions at the end. Um, so, I mean, if I have to circle back to something, I, I could. Uh, but I want there's just a lot to cover, so I might be talking a little faster than I would otherwise. <laughs> um, uh, we'll go over, you know, what the components are of a high, high availability cluster, what you need, uh, prerequisites, things you got to have in order to, to make a cluster, um, how to do a configuration of a cluster from a starting from a default configuration, uh, and how to test it, how to troubleshoot it if, uh, if you need to, and uh, how to how to upgrade your cluster. All right, first little overview of what a cluster is supposed to look like. Um, essentially, it's virtualizing two units so they look like one virtual unit, two things on the outside and the inside. 
Um, so you have your primary and your secondary node that are actually your two physical hardware devices, or they could be virtualized, uh, in like ESX or something, if you really wanted to. Um, and the world on the outside would talk to your WAN side CARP virtual address, and on the inside, everything would talk to your LAN side CARP virtual address. And, you know, but in the meantime, they still have addresses and all these subnets individually. So while they are actually two separate physical nodes, um, for all intents and purposes, for things on the inside and the outside that only talk to and from the CARP addresses, they just see that one address. They don't know if it's actually on the primary or the secondary, and they don't have to. They don't have to care. It'll, you know, it all just works from their perspective. So in this example, I've got our, our WAN is a 198.51.100 subnet. I've got 201 for the primary, 202 for the secondary, and 200 for our shared address. On the outside, uh, on the inside, I've just got the standard 192.168.1. 1. Uh, 1 1.1 is our CARP IP. That's going to be used locally for the gateway and DNS. Uh, 1.2 is the primary. 1.3 is our secondary. And uh, the, the CARP address will be on the outside will be used for like outbound NAT and maybe inbound like four forwards and things. But in this example, primarily outbound NAT. Here on our sync interface, uh, this is the interface that interconnects between the two nodes to carry configuration synchronization and state synchronization traffic. It just, it does not actually have any involvement in CARP. Um, it, so it just has two addresses, you know, one each for the, for the primary and secondary. But we'll get into more detail on all this here in just a second. Okay, so the basic components of an NHA cluster are IP address redundancy with CARP, configuration synchronization with XML RPC, and state synchronization with PFSync. Um, some people are tempted to call it a CARP cluster, but CARP is only one facet of the whole uh, shebang. So uh, really it's better to call it an HA cluster or a high availability cluster. Uh, it's kind of a mouthful compared to CARP cluster. We catch ourselves saying CARP cluster all the time, but in reality, it's, it's kind of a misnomer. Uh, not really dangerous at this level, uh, not like confu confusing the sync interface for a CARP interface, but uh, uh, but it's better to get in the habit of calling it an HA cluster or even just a cluster. So for the first requirement, we got an IP address redundancy. Uh, we use CARP for that. The CARP FIPS are shared virtually between the cluster nodes. Um, it works sort of like VRRP in Cisco land, if you know that, or HSRP to some extent. Uh, the heartbeats are transmitted on, inter on each interface with a CARP VIP. So in our example, we've got a CARP VIP on the WAN and a CARP VIP on the LAN. So the CARP heartbeats are actually transmitted on the WAN and the LAN. Um, it'll send out one heartbeat, heartbeat per VIP per interface per second, approximately. Uh, the, durate, or the frequency or period of the CARP VIPs is actually, you know, depends on your base setting and your SKU setting. Uh, the default base of one means it'll be sent out one once one per second, plus the SKU, uh, which for a master is zero, and for a secondary could be a hundred or higher. Um, just so you know, the the whichever node is going to be transmitting the fastest, like your primary node, is going to be the master because it transmits the most frequently, and so on. So if a secondary node stops seeing the heartbeats, or they come through too slowly, uh, say there's a little some latency or something happening at the operating system level on the primary that causes a delay, uh, the secondary node will see that and take over. And all of this, it, it only allows for active, passive only. We don't, it, so it's, it's high availability failover. It's not actually load balancing or anything like that. Okay. Uh, traffic going to the cluster from the outside should route to cart VIPs, um, and, you know, and even from the inside. So like from the outside, uh, if you've got an, uh, if you have a routed block of IP addresses from your upstream, you know they should route that to your CARP VIP. Uh, if you have VPNs, you want to build those to your CARP VIP. If you got port forwards, you want to build those to CARP VIPs. Uh, same with one-to-one -one NAT, you'd want to build that to CARP VIPs, or in the case, you know, except if they're routed, in which case you don't need any VIPs. Uh, so basically, if something is coming at you, you know, it should be coming to a CARP VIP. Same thing with the inside uh, local gateway for your clients is going to be the CARP VIP. Uh, and also DNS is going to be the CARP VIP if you're using the firewall for DNS. You don't want to have them address the nodes individually for any of that stuff because they don't know which one's up, which one's down. So by addressing the CARP VIP, they don't have to care. They just know, they just talk to the VIP and then the, the cluster figures out who they need to go to. Uh, the only exception to that is if you're actually managing these things, like if you're, if you're you know, going to the firewall GUI or SSH for the nodes, always use the direct interface IP addresses for that, not the VIP. because 
if you if you get in the bad habit of trying to manage this from the carp vip and you just tr go to the carp vip you might hit the secondary if the if the primary is down or you, know, you might hit the primary and never be able to reach the secondary because you're you're just going to the carp vip so uh whatever you do don't don't manage it by the carp vip dangerous stay away now and uh, traffic leaving from the cluster should originate from the carp vip uh, generally speaking that that's primarily outbound nat or vpn traffic and uh, as I mentioned, it can conflict with VRP and HSRP, which I'll, I'll touch on here in another few moments. So uh, basically, you mainly just need to make sure you don't use conflicting IDs. Uh, next up is the configuration synchronization. This does communicate via the sync interface. Uh, so you know it will copy your settings in certain supported areas from the primary over to the secondary when you click Save. Um, so it, it does not sync system specific settings like your interfaces, your interface assignments, interface configuration, uh, because those are tied you, typically physically to the to the machine. Uh, system advanced settings could be different between the two of them, uh, and system general settings like your host name, uh, system DNS servers, things like that. And most packages don't have a sync mechanism. Some do, but uh, I'll I'll mention that briefly again later. Um, but you know, if you if you look at the system high available high availability sync, there are a long list of areas that do sync. And you know, as long as you understand what does and what does sync, you, you know, you'll know what to expect. So things like your firewall rules, NAT, aliases, VPNs, that sort of stuff, that's all going to sync. Um, and as I noted here, it is really not strictly required for for a cluster, but it makes it much easier. Uh, it saves you from having to duplicate a lot of effort in in putting settings on one and the other so like if you without this you'd have to you know create the cart virtual addresses on both systems you'd have to make sure they had the right SKUs on both and everything else rather than rather than just letting the cluster handle the sync and figuring it all out automatically all right and uh, we have state synchronization with pf sync this also communicates via the sync interface. Uh, so any uh, state inserts, deletes, et cetera, so, you know, you know, new connection information from people going in through or out through the cluster, uh, it gets exchanged between the nodes. So the state table on both of them ends up being nearly, if not completely identical. Uh, now on 2.2, uh, the states are bound to interfaces, which means the physical interface assignments have to be identical. So like your WAN really needs to be, say for example, EM0 on both or IGB1 on both. Uh, say it's an EM on one and IGB on the other, then the states aren't going to line up. Which is definitely not what you want. Uh, there are ways around that, which I'll, I'll mention here in a bit. Um, so when the primary fails, the connections will continue to flow through the secondary because it has all of the state information in the in the state table already. Um, so you know it'll the connections are already coming in the LAN. They're leaving through the CARP VIP, so the NAT states all line up. Everything's just continues to flow and there's really no no worries there uh, but that does require use of the cart vips with nat on the way out um, or you know and using the nat the cart vip is the gateway on the way in uh, so nothing can be coming to or from the node specifically uh, it has to be you know carp in carp out and like like the configuration synchronization synchronization this is optional um, you can still do HA without this, but there will be a disruption if the primary fails. The secondary won't have the states for the traffic, so you know your firewall logs will get filled with traffic from you know it's just from out-of-state traffic, you know, half-closed connections, things like that, or you know the clients will still think their connections are open and transmit packets. Eventually, they'll figure it out. They can reconnect and and they'll get back up and through. There are some extreme situations that call for that to happen. Uh, or area, you know, times when you can't use PF sync, like you really, you know, you have to have uh, two different pieces of hardware and they can't line up, or you know, you have two different WANs, or which we don't recommend either. Um, or you've got, you know, just, you know, DHCP on the WAN. There are situations that call for it, but you know, in real, in reality, you're you're best to use it if you can. All right, some assumptions that I'm going to make when, when we start this configuration. Um, first off, we're just doing two firewalls in a cluster, just one primary, one secondary. Uh, you can use more, but uh, historically we've found it, it really just doesn't give you a big advantage. It's really not all that, all that much better than two. Uh, we have seen people that have had three or four in a cluster, and you know, it, it can require some manual changes and things and manual synchronization and it's really most of the time it's just not worth the effort 
so we're not going to cover that. Um, I'm, I'm assuming that both of these devices are at or near a default configuration rather than going over a conversion. You can convert from CARP to, uh, from an existing install to CARP. Um, it's just a little trickier. We might have a separate hangout or something to go over that another time. There's just a lot of hoop jumping because you have to like translate, tra you know, change your interface IPs, change what used to be your interface IP to a CARP VIP, and then go through the rest of these things. Um, I'm also going to assume that your devices have identical interfaces assigned in identical order, just so we don't have to worry about the issues I mentioned with PFSync and everything else. So as you'll see here, my interfaces are assigned. I've got WAN as EM0, LAN as EM1, on down to my sync interface at the end as EM5. And if I look at my secondary firewall, you'll see the interfaces are identical, and they're, they're in the identical order, and they are identical physically. Only thing that's different is the MAC addresses, which is fine. OK, um, well, before we do anything else, we need to pick a sync interface. Uh, and this is the interface that interconnects between the two units for XML, RPC, and PFSync traffic. Um, we call it a sync interface, so don't call it a CARP interface because CARP has nothing to do with this one. Um, it doesn't factor into CARP heartbeats. It doesn't actually factor into failover directly. Uh, it's only it's XML RPC and PF sync, so it's all synchronization traffic. So we call it a sync interface. Um, now this interface can take up quite a bit of bandwidth, uh, if you have, especially if you've got a lot of churn in your state table, a lot of connection turnover where people uh, come through, like if you've got web servers or a lot of very busy clients on the inside. Uh, generally a lot of traffic. Uh, there will be a lot of bandwidth taken up on this. So uh, it's really important to have that on its own separate physical interface. Uh, it can work without that. Uh, you, you could share it with, say, like a v, on a VLAN if you can, or uh, like you could run it on LAN. It's not as secure to do it that way, and it's certainly not um, as robust or you know, it won't have the same performance, but uh, it's possible if you can't avoid it. But if, if you can at all do it, I would do that. Uh, in this instance, you see on mine, I picked the opt4 interface, which is the sync for the sync interface here. And I chose the same on both. And again, just to stress it, they have to have the same number of interfaces and they must be assigned in identical order. Uh, and that if we checked on interfaces assigned, like I just showed you, that order has to be identical on both. And for our state synchroniza synchronization to work, they have to be the same type. Uh, as you'll notice on these, it was EMs all the way around because they're, they're VMs. Um, but if you have, uh, say, you do have two p different pieces of hardware, you could work around that by adding, say, the WAN to a single interface lag and on both. That way, the actual interface, as far as the states are concerned, is lag zero. And so it does, you know, sort of. Uh, abstracting that a little bit to, to let the states work. It's not ideal, but the benefits of uh, binding the states to the interfaces outweighed uh, the potential gotchas there. Or you could potentially do without state synchronization. So, you know, say you do have your interfaces out of order, you know, you're going to notice things like firewall rules appearing to be on the wrong interface, so to speak. Um, and, you know, other things won't line up. So, you know, if, you're sync inter if your interfaces were in a completely different order, you know, you just see settings, they would appear to get jumbled or corrupted as they move to the other one. And it's just that, you know, they, they, the primary thinks, you know, opt one is opt one in the secondary. So if it's really opt three, then it's going to look like it did something weird and copied things over for the wrong subnet or something like that. All right. In terms of IP address requirements for the cluster, um, I'm going with a traditional three interface interface three IP address per interface or subnet uh, configuration here. Uh, means I've got one IP address per node plus one CARP VIP for each interface. Uh, you know, like WAN and LAN and maybe a DMZ something like that. So that means that your WAN needs to be a slash 29 subnet or larger um, because you need to have you know one IP address for each node. The CARP VIP plus your gateway so that's a minimum of four. Uh, with a slash 29, you know, you could even have CARP on yours and CARP on the on the other side. There's six usable IPs, so you could have your gateway could use CARP and, and this could use CARP. Um, in the sync interface, it doesn't have CARP on it because it's not a CARP interface, and so it does not need an additional IP. It just needs one for each node. Uh, you can technically do single IP address CARP on 2.2. Uh, we don't generally recommend it yet because it's got some quirks, um, and it's not 
you know, an implementation quirk. It's just, you know, how it actually works in reality. Uh, when you're talking about doing a single IP address CARP on WAN, uh, it means that only the, mas the active master at the time, which is typically your primary, is going to be able to get out. So, you know, without that, your secondary couldn't install packages. It couldn't do a firmware update or an update check. Uh, couldn't download bogons. Anything that would involve communicating out to the internet from the secondary out that WAN is not going to work. Uh, maybe for a secondary WAN or a tertiary WAN, it might make sense, but uh, you know, I wouldn't do that unless you absolutely have to. Uh, so if you if the only way you can get internet in on that is a slash 30 on your WAN, you can do that by you know you can add private IP addresses to the interfaces directly, and then put a you know a cart VIP for your side of that slash 30. Uh, you would need to you know a couple other you know outbound NAT rules to NAT your outbound traffic to the cart VIP. Um, you know, it's just kind of tricky to work around. I'm not going to get too much into detail. It can work if you have to do it, but we don't recommend it. Um, LANs don't, it works fine on LANs because you don't you usually have to communicate directly to the nodes on, on your LANs, especially things like for a DMZ or an additional uh, internal interface. Um, but, you know, usually you don't have the subnet restrictions that you have with a LAN, so it's not as important there. So you could use it just fine on LANs. That, that doesn't matter either way. It's just most of the time it's just not necessary, and it's easier to just do the traditional three address per subnet method. All right. Um, and CARP does require a static IP on WAN for full functionality, um, because otherwise you're not going to get... Uh, Otherwise, you're not really going to be able to get your CARP address on there and have it all be static and be nice. Um, you could do DHCP or PPP on a PPPoE on a WAN, but you're you're not going to get seamless failover. Or on the flip side of that, you know, if you do have a small router ahead of you, you could do DHCP to your ISP or PPPoE, but um, you know, you'd end up with double NAT. Like you could do like a you could have a private IP address on that WAN as far as PFSense sees. The upstream box could do like a DMZ or one-to-one -one NAT from the actual real address back to your uh, CARP VIP, you know, and it can sort of work that way. Um, again, don't generally recommend it, but it can work, especially uh, if you're in a cr crunch to get to have that happen. Um, you could uh, even get away with, uh, uh, like with DHCP, you could get away with just having a separate IP address on WAN on each of them and not doing state synchronization, you know, it could work that way. There would just be a disruption on failover. Um, you know, so it's really, you know, trying to find a balance. Um, as long as you've got your primary WAN that, you know, with the static IP addresses, you could even uh, d do that for like a secondary or third WAN where it's not as key to have that happen. And all these nodes must connect to the same WANs identically. Um, you can't do multi-WAN with CARP, but each node has to connect to each WAN. So if you have two WANs, your primary is going to have to have a WAN 1 and a WAN 2 interface. Your secondary is going to have a WAN 1 and a WAN 2 interface. Uh, you can't have, say, WAN 1 on the primary, WAN 2 on the secondary, and expect to get HA and uh, and multi-WAN. That's not, it doesn't work that way. It's not, that's not going to, it's not feasible. Um, so uh, again, if you were forced to do something like that, you might be better off uh, uh, living with the double NAT method and actually still doing your static IPs locally and letting something ahead of you do the NAT. Um, it's ugly, but it is not as ugly as trying to combine uh, <laughs> combine failover with HA or multi-WAN with HA that way uh, in an unsupported way. Okay, um, well, and something else, before you actually want, you know, start setting up these CARP VIPs, we need to make sure on your local network that you don't have any CARP VRRP or HSRP in use that would conflict. Um, you know, because the MAC address of the CARP VIPs determined by the VHID, and the same thing goes with VRRP, uh, you need to make sure that you don't cause a MAC conflict by overlapping IDs. And there have been also issues with heartbeats and things like that if things are trying to advertise, you know, on the same ID. So you can just run a quick packet capture. Uh, we even have a filter for CARP and VRRP traffic on our on Diag packet capture, run a capture for a few seconds on each interface. Look and see if you see anything. If you do, you know, uh, you might be able to find it in the output or load it up in Wireshark. Make it real easy. Uh, just if it, if you see an ID, just note it and just make sure not to use it when you, when the time comes. So it's just it's not hard to it's not hard to see this and avoid it. But if you don't do if you don't do this step, you might find yourself in a little bit of pain later trying to figure out what went wrong. All right, uh, now before we get to setting up CARP, the two nodes have to have a little bit of basic configuration done on them 
you know, just to start out with. Uh, for example, you got to have a, a unique host name on each of them. So I just use a, you know, firewall A and B here. Uh, you could use primary and secondary, or you could come up with a, you know, a cute name if you have an internal naming scheme, uh, like Rocket and Groot, or Batman and Robin, Pinky and Brain, just so you know which is which, and so you know which, uh, you know, so it makes some sense to you. And uh, on your LAN side, you want to make sure you adjust the IP addresses before you try to connect them to the same switch locally. Um, so, you know, you, you don't want to plug everything into a switch before you adjust these. Otherwise, you'd end up with an IP conflict. So you got to get the primary set for like 1.2, then get your secondary set for .3, and then they can all be on the same switch at the same time and they won't conflict. The GUI must be running on the same port and protocol on both nodes. Uh, it defaults to HTTPS on 4.3. So that's what I use, and um, you're, you know you could move it to 4443 if you want, but you just have to make sure it matches on both. Uh, I would not recommend going to HTTP, but we've been over that in a previous Hangout. Always use HTTPS and um, put it on whatever port you, you deem necessary, but as long as it matches, you're fine. The admin account cannot be disabled uh, because the, sync, the config sync requires the use of the admin user and the, pa the admin password has to be the same on both nodes. Uh, well, I get, generally that's, you know, if you have users that synchronize between the two nodes, that's a requirement. Technically, you could have a mismatch if you don't synchronize your users. Um, the problem is if your, your password from firewall A is gonna overwrite your password from firewall B the first time you do a synchronize uh, task if you sync your users. So. You don't want to get into that. Um, and you know, both nodes got to have a static IP address WAN configured in the same subnet with a proper gateway and so on. So uh, basically, they each have to have you know separate you know connectivity out in the same WAN. And you also want to set up some DNS under system in general. Uh, if you're using the default uh, unbound and it's not in forwarding mode, which is also the default, you don't generally have to put them in there because it'll talk straight to the roots but it's a little easier just on everything if you have them there, even just as a backup. Okay. For a switch setup, um, you need to re th keep in mind that CARP uses multicast, so you don't want your switch to interfere, you know, block, limit, filter, anything, the multicast traffic. Uh, in particular, we've seen sw switches where IGMP snooping has caused a problem. We've had to turn it on, which in theory, IG IGMP snooping is great because it can stop multicast from flooding all your ports, but some switches have some really poor implementations of it that just do not get along with CARP. Uh, especially things like storm control as well, they could get flipped out by all the heartbeats. Almost all of your CARP status problems, like a dual master scenario, it's going to be your switch to blame. Um, something is stopping it from stopping the multicast from getting one to the other, or it's slowing it down or filtering it, rate limiting it, that sort of thing. So at a minimum, you got to make sure that your switch will allow the multicast traffic to be sent and received. It's going to have to allow that traffic to be sent, allow traffic to come from these nodes with multiple MAC addresses, because the cluster could send out a message from the CARP VIP, uh, which is going to have the CARP MAC, or it's going to it's going to send out a message from the node individually, like for an update check or a package uh, download, and you know that's going to have the actual real interface MAC, so it's going to be different. And uh, you need to allow the CARP VIP MAC address to move between the ports. Uh, so if you have like port security that's going to lock a MAC to a port, that's not going to work because the CARP VIP MAC is going to have to hop between the ports for the primary and secondary. So if you can disable that kind of stuff on a per port basis, go for it. Uh, this is especially important on your hypervisors, especially ESX. And things like ESX, uh, you have to turn on things like promiscuous mode, forward transmits, and allow MAC address changes on the ports that are you know, on the firewalls. Uh, because you know, promiscuous mode, it's going to let it keep, see that traffic to and from the CARP VIP. Forge transmits is going to let it uh, send out the packets from the uh, CARP VIP, and allowing MAC address changes will allow it to talk on both the CARP VIP and the interface VIP. All right, so moving on to a con the configuration of the cluster here, um, we have uh, we just need to set up the sync interface, uh, configure PF sync, configure XML RPC, uh, 
add some cart vips and outbound NAT, DHCP, and then we'll talk a little bit about what you would do for VPNs and other services and adding more interfaces. First up is our sync interface, which on here is just on interface at sync. Uh, formerly was opt4, uh, so you just enable the interface, call it sync, remember don't call it carp. Um, put it on static IP, drop in the IP address and subnet mask you picked earlier for your sync interface and save. And then do that on the secondary as well. You gotta make sure you don't block private networks or bogon networks because that would interfere with uh, the communication between the sync addresses and also it could interfere with multicast traffic that could be used by pfsync depending on your configuration. Now, we, once we've got our uh, interface configured, we need to go over here to, and add some rules. Now, here on the sync interface, uh, you can see I've got a rule that it's going to pass. The first rule is going to pass my GUI traffic for config sync, uh, and that's TCP from my sync net to a destination of the sync address on port four, on port 443. And next is the state synchronization traffic, which is the PF sync protocol from the sync net to any. I do any there because depending on your configuration, the destination could be multicast. Uh, and here I just got a, a rule to allow ICMP ping for diagnostics. And then on the secondary, when you first do this, uh, you just I like to add just a one allow all rule on the secondary to start with. And then when you do your first configuration synchronization, uh, if you look at your rules on the secondary, you know immediately if the rules are identical that your sync worked. So it's a, it's a great way to see that. Now to actually start the HA configuration, we come up here uh, to go, go to system and high availability sync. And we're gonna set up PF sync. And this, this will get set up on both nodes and I'll show you the secondaries config here in a second. Uh, first, just check your synchronized states checkbox. Pick your sync interface from your synchronized interface dropdown and put in your peer address here. So I'm looking at my primary firewall A, so I put in the sync address of firewall B, the secondary. Now if I flip over here, and go to HA sync. You can see I also have synchronized states enabled, synchronized interface picked, and since I'm looking at firewall B, this is the sync IP of firewall A, not two. And you can either save these settings now or wait until after, uh, on the secondary, you wanna save them now because you're, you're done with that page. On the primary, you can wait until after we fill in the next section. And again, um, that is optional. The the PF sync synchronized peer IP is optional. If you put it in, they will direct they will do like directed unicast traffic toward the two nodes to do the sync. If you leave that blank, uh, you need to do that for clusters where you have multiple nodes because it will send that sync traffic to multicast, and then every node in that segment will get will get the traffic. Uh, generally speaking, with just two nodes, it's safer to put the address in there. And I've just noticed a smoother experience with that in the past. I like to do that if I can. All right, next we've got our configuration synchronization, the XML RPC section. section, section. Um, like we did up here, you put in the address of the secondary. And again, the, I think I mentioned it before, but this part only gets configured on your primary node. Do not set any of this up on the secondary uh, in a two cluster node. Uh, if you've got multiple nodes, you could, you know, go, your sync would go from primary to the secondary, and then from the secondary to the tertiary, tertiary and, and so on and so forth. Uh, but the two nodes can't synchronize back to each other. A can't go to B and B to A. Oh, you get stuck in a loop. All right, so um, synchronize to config to IP is your secondary. Uh, you put in your admin username and the admin password. And you can see here the list of items that will sync. You got users, auth servers, certificates, rules, firewall schedules, and so on. I generally check everything, although you know what you need you know, will depend on your particular environment. You may have something you don't want to sync. You may have something you want to manage manually. That's all up to you. Um, I do everything just because it's the easiest thing to do, to do in this case, and we, you know, there's no reason not to in this particular instance. All right. After you do all that, you hit save. Um, and you make sure you save on both nodes. And from here on out, you want to make sure that any of those areas you set to sync, you do not actually make any changes on the secondary in those areas, because the moment the primary synchronizes, your changes are going to get overwritten. Hmm. Sorry. 
Okay, now we've got our config sync in. We just need to add in some carp vips. Now, because we have our synchronization set up, uh, we only need to add these on the primary. So you just go up here to firewall, virtual IPs. We're going to add one VIP per interface that's going to have a user traffic. So basically everything but your sync interface is going to have a card VIP on it. In this case, that means your WAN and your LAN. Um, so here, if we look at our WAN card VIP, um, you select the type as CARP. You pick your interface. Here I put in the CARP VIP, and you have to make sure the subnet mask matches the interface. Uh, so because my WAN interface is a slash 24, make that one a 24. You can just uh, put in a randomly generated password here. Um, you don't need to know this one yourself. Uh, this will get synchronized between the two and it's used for authenticating the the uh, heartbeats things. Um, so uh, because it's automatically synchronized between the nodes, they will, you know, you put this in the primary, the secondary will know. So it doesn't hurt to just drop a randomly generated password in there or match the keyboard, whatever your preferred method is. <laughs> Uh, for the VHID group, you just want to make sure you avoid any IDs you found before when you were scanning for CARP. Um, what I like to do is in a subnet like this that's got a lot of IP addresses, uh, especially if you're using a high address, I make the VHID match the last octet of the IP address, just, to, just a convenience thing. Uh, but you could start at 1, you could start at 100, you know, anything, anything you want up to 254. Uh, but I, usually it's a lot of people start at 1. But you know, if you're if you're wanting to avoid conflicts now and in the future, it's better to start a little higher. We touched on base and skew before. I'm using the default base of one for one second delay between heartbeats and skew of zero for the master. Uh, generally speaking, it's best to use either zero or one for the master, depending on uh, what documents you read. Uh, usually, one is the 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 preferred default, uh, but zero. It, doesn't hurt in this case. Uh, we may change our stance on that in the future and change the default to one, uh, but for the moment we're still using zero. Uh, base is in whole seconds and skew is one two fifty sixth of a second. So uh, it's just a, you know, a fraction of a second basically. So if you if you find that your your setup is sensitive to latency, you could jump or you know nudge the base up a little higher, go to two or three. Don't adjust the skew for that. Only ever adjust the base and make sure the base matches between the two nodes. All right, and then put in your description. Then you save that and then uh, repeat that for your LAN. So I just use 192.168.11.24 so with a VHID of one and you know, again, base one skew of, uh, skew of zero since I'm on the master. And now, now that you have those carp bips in, when you when you come back here and you save, you know you apply changes, and then you just go. Uh, we can check that it worked. Go over here to status carp. You'll see I'm on firewall A, and we are master status. Flip over here to firewall B. Go to status and carp, and you'll see we are backup status. So everything is a okay here. And this, you know, it shows your your WAN interface, and this is the VHID, and then the IP address, and the status. And if you need more VIPs, you can always add them in now, or you could, uh, you know, add them in later, whichever point you need. And now that our VIPs are in, and we've made sure that they're okay, uh, let's go up to NAT outbound. And by default, it's on automatic. Uh, but you want to move, switch it over to manual and then press save, which will populate populate this list of rules. Um, and then you want to, for any of these internal subnets, which uh, to get out, you want to make sure you edit each of these rules and change the translation here to be the carp VIP or a carp VIP if you have multiple. So you want to make sure you're natting out to a carp VIP and repeat that change for every rule that is going to be natting your outbound traffic. Now, if you have a public IP subnet on your LAN or a DMZ, uh, then you just want to delete the NAT rules because you don't need them. And then, you know, in the future, if you add an additional local interface and it's using a private subnet, you will have to come and manually add your own rules in here. You could copy the LAN rules, adjust the subnet. You could change, you know, make an alias and use this alias as the source here. Whatever you want to do for that. But just keep in mind, in the future, when you add an interface, you got to add more NAT yourself manually because it's not being automatically managed anymore. 
So and if you have port forwards to add, you can add those here. Uh, just make sure that in your destination field, you set your carp VIP. And uh, same with one-to-one -one NAT. Um, you would just type in the carp VIP when you make the one-to-one -one NAT rule here in the external subnet IP. You just fill in your carp, carp IP there. If you're doing that like on a third or fourth carp IP, you know, something like that. All right, um, moving on to DHCP, we go here under services and DHCP server. There's a few adjustments we have to make here for our LAN DHCP. First up, you got our DNS server. We need to point that to the CARP VIP. We've got our gateway that also needs to be the CARP VIP. And then our failover peer address, that is the real IP interface IP address of the secondary in the LAN subnet. That's not the sync interface IP. It's actually the LAN IP address of the secondary. So just change those three things. The DNS server to the CARP VIP, gateway to the CARP VIP, failover IP to the peers LAN IP, and then save that. And then if you have like a DMZ or other local interfaces that use DHCP, just go down the line and do that for the others. And then uh, when you check your status, that should have synchronized over to your secondary already. And you'll see it's got a my state normal, pure state normal. That's what you want to see. Here on the secondary, if we go to DHCP lease status, my state normal, pure state normal. That's all good. And you can see they've got leases in their table that are shared. So if, like we are, you're using the default DNS resolver unbound, um, there is a slight bug even in 2.2.3 uh, where it won't work on the cart VIP until you just come here and just press save on the settings and then apply. Uh, by default, there's no interface assigned here locally. Um, and there was just a little quirk in the code that made it reply from the wrong address if there was nothing selected because it's it it wasn't fully assuming all for everything it should have. Uh, but once you press save with the all selected, it's fine. Uh, for, for VPNs and other local services, you just need to make sure that you build them to a CARP VIP, like here for IPsec. Your interface is gonna be CARP VIP on the WAN. Same for OpenVPN, if you make a server, client, whatever, interface is CARP VIP. And by selecting a cart bit for some of these things, there is special behavior that happens, especially for an open VPN client. When you, if you have an open VPN client, it is extremely important that you set that to be your cart VIP because that enables uh, some detection in open VPN for the fact that it's on a CARP IP. An open VPN client only should be running on whichever node is master. Uh, and so it will see that and it will shut down the open VPN client on the secondary node until it becomes master, at which point it fires it up. You know, and and then you know when it, when the primary recovers, then it will shut down on the secondary and start back up on the primary. So if the client is running on both at the same time, it will conflict. So you need to make sure to use that. Now, support for CARP in packages varies a lot. Uh, there are several packages that do synchronize their settings. Um, not all of them need special handling for CARP. Uh, Two ones of note are Quagga for OSPF or uh, OpenBGPD. They do need to have uh, CARP. They, they each have an IP address you fill in to tell you know to detect the CARP status, and they will do similar to OpenVPN, where they only run on whichever node is master, and they will switch accordingly as you, as things fail. Um, and then just a little reminder, when you add a new interface, say you add a DMZ or a LAN2 or you know something else internally you need to uh, assign the interface on both identically, enable the interface on both using a different IP address in the same subnet, and then on the primary only, because these will synchronize, you add a CARP VIP, add your firewall rules, add manual outbound NAT, set up DHCP. Make sure you use the CARP VIP in that subnet for DNS and the gateway rules and DHCP. And that's it, you can just keep on going with however many interfaces you got. Now to test this, uh, we just need to make sure that we got a client that can pass through the cluster. And I've got this guy here behind him. 
Um, making sure I'm just going to start a ping to Google. I think he's he can get out. I can do a Google search. There it goes. Uh, we verified XML RPC because uh, we already saw that our DHCP and CARP was syncing. But you can go over here to Status, Filter Reload, and you can see it says the sync completed successfully, but you can force a new sync if you want by pressing Force Config Sync. It will spin through some other settings and then go back to complete, or if it fails, it'll generate a notice and yell at you that it didn't work, and then the logs will tell you why. Uh, we can check our CARP status here on Status CARP, which you know our primary shows master. Backup shows backup, or secondary shows backup. And we can see our uh, state sync by checking the PF sync nodes here. If you look at these, the PF sync nodes on both of them are identical. That tells us our state sync is working. Now to test failover, um, you can disable CARP. Uh, doing the temporary disable CARP will work. It's a little more disruptive than just using maintenance mode or even unplugging an interface. But let me just try persist persistent maintenance mode. You can see we switched that. Now our primary here shows backup and our secondary shows master. And if we look over here, our ping is still going. <clears throat> it didn't even lose a single ping. If we come back out of maintenance mode, that happens so fast you kind of have to refresh the page. <laughs> uh, our, now we're back to master status here and back up there. And still no pings lost. Now for a little bit more disruptive test, I'm going to uh, unplug the virtual interface on the LAN of the primary. And you'll see it put the VIP into init state, which is generally something you'll see if the interface is unplugged. And uh, up here at the top, there's a warning it displayed. It saw that there was an interface problem, and it demoted to backup status. So you know, check link status and the interface with the configured cart VIPs, so on and so forth. Come over here and look. And eh, it lost a couple of packets, but only three uh, or four. So nothing. Nothing too dramatic. Uh, somebody on VoIP might notice a little bit of a glitch. Um, <clears throat> uh, generally, if you're downloading or streaming something, nobody would have noticed that. All right, let's put this interface back on. And there we go. Master, back here, as backup. And Again, lost a couple of pings, but nothing nothing earth shattering. And you could, you know, actually try and surf and everything during that time. Uh, you know, it's usually it's the best test is to actually do everything when you're in the failover state. Try and pull an IP address from DHCP. Try to um, try to surf. You know, any if you have packages installed, you want to test your package, your VPNs. You want to test your VPNs. Do all of that when you're in the fail fail the state when you're failed over to the secondary node. And then when you go back to the primary, test all of that again and make sure everything's going back through the primary node just like you want. A couple things to think about for troubleshooting. Um, first is just to review everything you've done, like match it back up against what we've done here. Um, you know, it's, it's really easy to miss a step or something, especially if it was something I didn't you know, put extra emphasis on. Um, check the cart VIP status. Like I just showed you with the interface unplugged, it was in a init. Um, so you want to make sure the interfaces are all plugged in. Um, if you have plans to configure a DMZ, but it's not actually plugged in yet, don't put a CARP VIP on it because that will cause your primary to demote itself. So don't put CARP on an interface until you've actually got it plugged in and ready to use, or at least have a link on the interface. Um, check for conflicting VHIDs like I showed you with the packet capture. Um, make sure your subnet mask matches on your CARP VIPs. Uh, go on your switches and double check everything. Make sure... Um, Make sure that the boxes are on the same layer two in the right places, or the, like the WAN's on the same layer two, LAN's on a you know a, diff, a separate but the same layer two um, between the nodes anyway. Try to ping between the interfaces. You might have to add some firewall rules, especially to your WAN. 
uh, to let that happen. Uh, make sure if you if you've got you know a, a whole switch fabric that's trunking everything or stack switches, make sure all of that's set up right. Make sure your you know your traffic is actually going through the trunking right. Um, you could even just swap in a different switch temporarily to rule out a switch issue, uh, which is especially a problem. We have we've seen some cheapy uh, like gate, business gateway type things from ISPs that don't handle CARP too well, uh, but you drop even just a cheapy unmanaged switch in between them and it's just fine. Um, and again, like I mentioned earlier, either, either turn off or toggle things like IGMP snooping, broadcast multicast storm control, so on and so forth, because that's going to be the vast majority of your issues are going to be on the switch layer two issues. Um, now for things like uh, PFSync or XML RPC, most of that you're going to be able to diagnose very easily by either the firewall log showing it blocked on the secondary or the system log will tell you uh, like why XML RPC might have failed, things like that. So just keep an eye on the logs for those. All right, when it comes time to upgrade your cluster, um, the first thing to do is make sure you review the change log, the broad log, and the upgrade guide. If you see the dashboard says, ooh, there's an update available, don't just click that. <laughs> you gotta make sure you know what you're getting into. Um, so you know, if we found an issue with an upgrade or if we have, had anything uh, come up or things that we know about, we'll, we'll drop notes there. Uh, especially if you're coming across multiple versions or a major version, you really need to make sure you review that information first. And after you've done that, make sure you take a backup. You know, it just takes a second, go to Diagnostics, Backup Restore, grab a backup. Um, it's so easy, but a lot of people overlook that. And then they, they hit upgrade and if something happens, they're in a panic because, oh, I, my upgrade didn't go out and I, and I don't have a backup. No, it's, it's so easy, there's not really an excuse to skip that step. So can't stress it enough, take a backup, take multiple, make sure they're good, you know, save them someplace safe. All right, once you got your backups in hand, uh, upgrade your secondary. Um, and then once the uh, once the upgrade succeeds on the secondary, you know, look it over, make sure it's okay. And then um, to test the secondary, you switch the CARP, switch CARP into maintenance mode on the primary, which will then cause the secondary to take over. Test it out, make sure traffic's flowing, make sure VPNs work, all that happy stuff. Once that's all flowing and everything's confirmed to work, um, go ahead and upgrade the primary. And when that comes back up, if everything looks okay, you can exit maintenance mode and it will take the, take the master role back over. Uh, using maintenance mode is important an important step there because without that, if you just temporarily disabled CARP on the primary to fail it over, uh, when it comes back up, it will immediately assume the master role, which you may not want if, if things aren't working right. So maintenance mode really helps there uh, because it makes sure it doesn't switch back until you want it to switch back. So then once you're back up and running on the primary node, um, test everything again, make sure everything is working fine. And that's it. I don't know if anybody had any questions. I know uh, so Kevin said, would love to see the addition of multi-WAN to this demo. Um, yeah, we might, if I do a follow-up, I could do multi-WAN. That um, generally is really not too hard. Uh, it's just a combination of multi-WAN and this. Um, you just need to add your second WAN interfaces, add your cart VIPs to that, make sure you have your gateways set up just like you would adding a second WAN. You just add it to both and then make sure you add your cart VIP and your outbound NAT to use that second WAN. And then, you know, the rest of it's just just like any other multi-WAN. you got your gateway groups, uh, policy routing, so on and so forth. Um, in the book, we actually have a, big, a really much more complicated diagram that shows you uh, what that looks like with multi-WAN, and it's, it's kind of hairy, but, <laughs> but it works. All right, anybody else have questions? I'll give you a moment to type them out. Uh, just so you know, Kevin, this is Jim, not Chris. Just, I know it says Chris up there, but he's just the name on the account. <laughs> I know I went through that kind of fast, but I had to had to go a little faster than usual because I had a lot of slides to get through. It's a pretty complicated topic. Although the individual pieces aren't too bad, it's just uh, it all adds together into something. It seems to seems to I don't know 
have a lot of inertia where people they don't like once you get started it's not that difficult sort of like vlans people think vlans are these big confusing mysterious things but then once they get started with them it's like oh, it's not that bad <laughs> Anybody? Any questions? If not, I'll wrap it up. Make sure I'm not missing any over here. Well, um, if you have any suggestions for a future hangout, you know, feel free to drop us a line, either you know uh, through the support system or on the forum, the blog, however you want to reach us. Um, we do have some other stuff planned yet. Um, I have a few a few topics I'd like to get to yet. That uh, I, so I mean I have a I have a backlog of things, even if we don't get a lot of good suggestions. But as time goes on, we like to we like to know what people want to see. Uh, things we might need to go back and cover differently or in more detail or uh, things we might need to, to touch on again. Uh, but all right. So just, uh, if you think of anything, just let us know. Otherwise, uh, we'll see you next month. <laughs> yeah. So carp on lag with traffic shaving. <laughs> That's a good one. Uh, but yeah, we eventually we will have a, uh, a hangout with traffic shaping. It's, it's something I'd like to do. Uh, I just need to figure out a way to split it up into a way I, it's going to, it's going to take multiple hangouts. It's too complicated just for one. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you for attending. And we